from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Good afternoon. My name is Georgia Dorn and I'm the Chief of the Hispanic Division. And I'm so happy to see so many people here on a day when everybody thinks we're closed. I get calls from every embassy of Latin America saying, ¿Pero están abiertos? No. Por supuesto que estamos abiertos. Well, anyway, it is a great pleasure to welcome everybody here to hear Andres Neumann. Some housekeeping um, mentions. Please um, close your cell phones, put them on mute, and uh, you will be filmed for cybercasting. So please know that your image and your voice will be cybercast in the, uh, in, in, in the questions and answer period. It is a great pleasure to have Andres Neumann here, who has been mentioned in the New York Times yesterday with a long article. So if you want to see his full biography, look at the New York Times for April 16th. Two days ago, actually, not one day ago. But anyway, he is uh, all of 37 years old and has published more than 20 books. And the great Chilean writer Roberto Bolaño said about him that he is the, the uh, literature of the 20th century belongs to Andres Neumann, which is wonderful. This month, Farrar, Strauss, and Giroux published Talking to Ourselves, which is the book he's going to be talking about. And he will be uh, having a conversation with Catalina Gomez, who is the assistant curator for the Archive of Hispanic Literature and Tape. And by the way, Andres recorded last year for the archive. Thank you very much. Oh, you will read too. I forgot to say that. <laughs> Good <laughs> morning, it's a pleasure to be here and I'm surprised there's someone there. We indeed are not closed and, and we're in such a good company, so thank, really thank you for inviting me. I'm delighted to be here and I see a few friends even if I'm even though I'm slightly short-sighted, I can tell there are a few friends there that makes me feel even more at home. Um, I will be at reading first and then we'll have a conversation with my friend Catalina, so I hope you enjoy the reading. I will not say too much about the excerpts I'm reading because uh, we prefer to go directly to the literature and then uh, doing remarks, comments, complaints, weepings, and everything, aggressions to the author and everything. <clears throat> Although what I have to say is that I'm doing three voices now. Not literally, but uh, metaphorically. Uh, I have to become three different, very different people. So I will be a woman slightly bearded, um, I will be a man and I will be a child. That's, that's the easy one, the easiest one for me. Um, because Talking to Ourselves is a novel, among other things, narrated from three perspectives and with three voices, which uh, represent the three main ways we have to address to ourselves. So they are not only uh, Elena, Mario, and Lito, the mother, the father, and the son. But as well, these are three ways of talking, three three um, modes of uh, of speaking. Um, the boy thinks, the father talks, and the mother writes. And I think that uh, covers all the possible ways to address to ourselves. So. I'm going to start with the father who is recording a letter, a future letter for his son whenever he's ready to listen to this letter. So he's talking literally to the future.
I want to live my death. It's all I have left. I don't want it taken away from me. When you reach my age, more or less, perhaps you'll start to feel protective. And you're not going to have a father to look after. There'll be no father to enable you to be that son. I'll be a lost opportunity. And so now, well, now comes the advice. I feel a bit ridiculous. The ideal thing would be for you to observe me half your life and think, all right, let's salvage this and this from this misguided man who is my father and let the devil take the rest. Too bad, we can't. We can't. Enjoy life, do you hear? It's hard work enjoying life. And have patience, not too much. And look after yourself as if you knew you would always be young, even though you won't know it, and that's okay. And have plenty of sex, son. Do it for your sake, and mine, and even your mother's, lots of sex. And if you have children, have them late. And go to the beach in winter. In winter is better, you'll see. My head hurts, yet I feel good. It's hard to explain. And go traveling on your own once in a while. And try not to fall in love all the time. <laughs> and care about your looks. Do you hear me? Men who don't care about their looks are afraid of being queer. And if you are a queer, be a man. In short, advice isn't much use. If you disagree with it, you don't listen. And if you already agree, you don't need it. Never trust advice, son. Travel agents advise you to go places they've never been. You'll love me more when you're old. I thought of my father the moment we got down from the truck. Our true love for our parents is posthumous. Forgive me for that. I'm already proud of the things you're going to do. I love the way you count the time on your fingers when you set the alarm clock. Or do you think I don't see? You do it secretly under the covers, so I won't know you have difficulty working it out. I'm going to ask you a favor. Whatever happens, whatever age you are, don't stop counting the time on your fingers. Promise me, Octopus. That was Mario. And the octopus. Octopus or octopus? Octopus. 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 Okay. Um, this is now I'm her. Obviously. Um, as the French poet Rimbaud said, "C'est un autre," or "C'est une autre." When someone you slept with dies, you begin to doubt their body and yours. The once touched body withdraws from the hypothesis of a reencounter. It becomes unverifiable, may not have existed. Your own body loses substance. Your muscles fill with vapor. They don't know what it was they were clutching. When someone with whom you have slept dies, you never sleep in the same way again. Your body doesn't let itself go when it is in bed. Your arms and legs open as though clinging to the rhyme of a well, trying not to fall in. It insists on waking up earlier, on making sure at least it possesses itself. When someone with whom you have slept dies, the caresses you gave their skin change direction, they go from relieved presence to posthumous experience. There is a hint of salvation and a hint of violation about imagining that skin now. A posteriori necrophilia. The beauty that was once with us remains stuck to us, as does its fear, its hurt.
you know those times when, when you're having a hard time and everybody seems happy and that's so unfair you just can't stand that the world just keeps on spinning around so this is like the logical continuation of the previous excerpt I'm, I'm going to be jumping uh, uh, through different excerpts of Elena's diary she's writing a diary she thinks nobody is reading but we are you are when I see a couple kissing, believing they love one another, believing they will endure, whispering into each other's ear in the name of an instinct to which they give lofty names. When I see them caressing one another with that embarrassing avidness, that expectation of discovering something crucial in the other's skin. When I see their mouths becoming entangled, the exchange of tongues, their freshly showered hair, their unruly hands, fabric rubbing and lifting up like the most sordid of curtains, the anxious stick of knees bouncing like springs, cheap beds in one-night hotels they will later remember as palaces. When I see two fools expressing their desire with impunity, in broad daylight, as though I weren't watching them, it's not merely invite, I feel. I also pity them. I pity their rotten future. And I get up and ask for the bill. And I smile at them askance, as though I had returned from a war which the two of them have no idea is about to commence. She's so peaceful. Although, she doesn't suffer all the time, as you will see. Ezekiel's power can't be appreciated when you see him naked. He has to be seen in movement, gesticulating, approaching, assaulting, his physique is a refutation of the platonic. He is audacious, not muscular. Intense, not athletic. What is irresistible is his conviction, which encourages me to overlook my own defects. This is essential when in bed with a man. Not what I see in his body, what he can make me see in mine. And finally, she's a strong reader. She leaves underlining books in order to understand reality, as if recognizing her own uh, silences. She says, when a book tells me something I was trying to say, I feel the right to appropriate its words as if they had once belonged to me and I were taking them back. See you soon, Elena, and then I will be the little child. They are going through highways, lost highways, on an impossible border between Latin America and Spain, these secondary, uh, secondary roads, which I wish they existed, because those would be my roads, and they, they stop now and then in terrible hotels because the father is too tired to keep on driving, but the father is so embarrassed <coughs> to to be there in those really. Um, cheap hotels with his 10 years old son who is having a great time anyway. Mm -hmm. I should do something like this now. Mm -hmm. A girl with a shell necklace and green lipstick greets us. Now, it can be green, or can't, can it? The lights are fluorescent. The girl sees me hiding behind Dad and smiles. She has blue teeth. 
In reception, there are mirrors broken on purpose and plastic flowers in ice cream glasses. The girl asks us not to open the blinds in the room because they are stuck. Besides, she winks. With this wing, it's best you don't even try. After she winks, her top eyelashes come off and get tangled in her bottom eyelashes. I want to tell her, but I'm too shy. That whispers in my ear, Gorilla from Manila. There's good news and bad. The good news is they have internet. The bad news is it isn't working. <laughs> we go upstairs to put our things in our room. The carpet smells of cigarettes. It ha has holes bigger than my feet. You could play mini golf on it. Little, that says, looking at the carpet, whatever you do, don't walk around barefoot. And when you go to bed, take the quilt off first. Do you hear? I spot two white towels on a chair. Well more or less white. I sniff them. Luckily, they smell of soap. I open the bathroom door. There are only wire hangers and a safe. What a weird room. That goes into the hallway. I hear him talking to himself. This is impossible, he mutters. I told that bitch we wanted and sweet. The word bitch always makes me giggle. I like it when dad says it. It doesn't sound the same when my friends and I say it. Dad comes back in. He picks up the towels. He says to me, at least there's hot water in the shower. Bring your clothes on and please do as I say and don't touch anything, okay? In the bar, I gobble down two cheeseburgers, a plate of french fries with a ton of hot sauce and a scoop of ice cream covered in syrup. Dad only eats half his. He says he wants to lose some more weight. He takes an aspirin with a glass of water. Before he got the virus, he used to eat loads. And he loved going to restaurants. What? I love my mouth full of ice cream. So you didn't like your big fat belly? What about you, skinny chops? He teases. Are you sure you don't need another hamburger? I don't know what time it is. I don't feel like going to bed yet. Troubling is tiring, but it wakes me up. Dad leaves the table. He goes over to the bar. He pays. He's looking at me very hard. I think that as soon as I finish my ice cream, we're going to have to go up to the room. Oof. Dad is coming back. He walks up to me. He lifts my head in his hands and he suggests we stay and have a drink. A drink! That and me in a bar after dark. I can't believe it. It's totally awesome. I get up, I wipe the syrup off my mouth with my sleeve, I stand up very straight and we walk together to the bar. Dad orders a whiskey. I order a Fanta with lots and lots of ice. And to finish with, um, sorry, sorry, and I was told to to read um, two very very short excerpts. One from Traveler of the Century, the previous novel. It's just half a page, really. Not the novel, as you can see, it's a bit more than half a page. But I will read half a page. And I was told to select one of these excerpts I have just read and read it in Spanish just to give you the flavor, let's say. So, so yes, I will, I will go, we'll go with, um, with the Spanish one first. Um, maybe I will read the, the father's excerpt, um, the advices, which is kind of amusing. Do you prefer Argentinian accent or a Spaniard accent? <laughs> I have both, and both are fake. No. Argentine, I mean, that, 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 I don't need anything else but that, so Argentine. Uh, 
Do you know what's an Argentine? It's a joke, they say. An Argentine is a Spaniard talking Italian and dreaming about being French. Alors, je veux lire. Okay. Diviértete, ¿me oyes? Cuesta mucho trabajo divertirse. Y ten paciencia, no demasiada. Y cuídate como si supieras que no siempre vas a ser joven. Aunque no vas a saberlo, y está bien. Y que siempre haya sexo, hijo, hazlo por ti y también por mí, hasta por tu madre, mucho sexo. Y que los hijos vengan tarde, si vienen. Y ve a la playa en invierno, en invierno es mejor, ya vas a ver. Me duele la cabeza, pero me siento bien, no sé cómo decirlo. Y que de vez en cuando viajes solo, y que no te enamores todo el tiempo. Y sé coqueto, ¿me oyes? Los hombres que no son coquetos tienen miedo de ser maricones. Y si eres maricón, sé un hombre. En fin, los consejos sirven de poco. Si no estás de acuerdo, no los escuchas, y si ya estás de acuerdo, no los necesitas. Nunca confíes en los consejos, hijo. Un agente de viajes recomienda lugares a los que nunca va. Me vas a querer más cuando envejezcas. Pensé en mi padre en cuanto nos bajamos del camión. El verdadero amor por los padres es póstumo. Perdóname por eso. Ya me siento orgulloso de lo que vas a hacer. Me encanta cómo cuentas las horas con los dedos cuando pones el despertador. ¿No te crees que no te veo? Lo haces escondidas por debajo de la manta para que yo no sepa que te cuesta hacer la suma. Voy a pedirte un favor. Pase lo que pase, por muchos años que tengas, no dejes de contar las horas con los dedos. And finally, this short excerpt about Traveler of the Century, which is, among other things, uh, a novel, a fiction about translation in all uh, the possible senses of translation, literary translation and as well historical translation, cultural translation, and uh, also uh, loving or sexual translation. And this excerpt uh, try, tries to reflect of translation as an act of love and love as an act of translation. So these two lovers translate together and a few more things. During the four hours they spent alone three times a week, Hans and Sophie alternated between books and bed, bed and books exploring one another in words and reading one another's bodies. Thus, inadvertently, they developed a shared language, rewriting what they read, translating one another mutually. The more they worked together, the more similarities they discovered between love and translation, understanding a person and translating a text, retelling a poem in a different language and putting into words what the other was feeling. Both exercises were as happy as they were incomplete. Doubts always remained. Words that needed changing missed nuances. They were both aware of the impossibility of achieving transparency as lovers and as translators. Cultural, political, biographical and sexual differences acted as a filter. The more they tried to counter them, the greater the dangers, obstacles, misunderstandings, and yet, at the same time, the bridges between the languages, between them, became broader and broader. Thanks a lot. Your book. And your book. <laughs> Let's make sure that we turn these on correctly. Can everyone hear me okay? Mm -hmm. yeah? Almost the heart. And <laughs> 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 this is so, so great to have you here. It's, we're so delighted and um, I'm very delighted to have you here. Thank you very much. Um, talking to ourselves, what a touching book. It was, so it's, it's such a simple narrative, but yet so, hmm. so touching. Uh, we got to, uh, we had a good idea of, of some the, the narrative style and the characters through your readings, but would you mind 
telling us a little more about the plot and the story yeah. of the novel. Yes, well, thank you very much for being here with me. Um, yeah, it has two main plots, we could say, or two, two stories inside the plot. The first one uh, has to do with a road trip uh, between father and son. His father is ill, but the son doesn't know this. Uh, so the father has begun to live as if it was the last day, which is a very clever thing we all should do. <laughs> but you don't do it until it's too late. So that's the strange wisdom that the illness gives you too late. Uh, or not. So maybe not that late, because the father decides, just in case, to do a trip with his son, which is something that he has never done before. Uh, and that deeply connects him with his own father because he hated his father but his father was a driver and his best memory about his own father was you know driving with his father this this uh, trunk no truck truck no the trunk is another thing full of books <laughs> so yeah <coughs> his truck um, so he goes out with his son for the very first time he borrows the truck from his brother who is a driver and and undertake put the two of them this strange trip uh, so his father is sort of creating a memory for his son a memory which will develop through time regardless of his or not there um, but there is the kind of B side of this uh, of this road trip because this is very much the male tradition of you know the male hero trying to find his own identity and so I mean what about Penelope so the book pretends to be a road trip with Ulysses as uh, Ulysses you say Ulysses and his son but it moves uh, gradually towards the figure of the character of Penelope in this case she's Elena who is supposed to be waiting at home, but then she undertakes uh, another kind of risky adventure of her own, and she um, becomes the main character, the protagonist of the novel. So it's the female part, the hidden female part of every male uh, road trip. If you, we think about this tradition, we can think about, I don't know, uh, well, obviously from the Odyssey to the road, Cormac McCarthy's road, there's always a silence uh, around the field. There's, there's a gap in the female side. So I was interested in turning this uh, for forgotten uh, character, the main character of the road trip. The, the road trip she's, she has been excluded from. And the second story is about, again, the A, a side and the B side of, of an illness. Uh, if you go to the tradition of illness, which is a very long tradition in literature, um, we can think of Tolstoy, uh, we can think of, Virg uh, I mean, uh, Ivan, Ivan Illich's death, uh, or On Being Ill uh, by Virginia Woolf, which is one of the most brilliant books uh, ever written about, about illness. Uh, or we can go uh, for Polanyo, his last books or his life essays, the illness is almost always um, focused on the ill person. So again, there is a silence. About whom? About the caregiver. Who is taking care of the caretaker? Who is caring the caregiver? So again, in Elena, there is a silence uh, emerging because she tells the novel of the caregiver not the novel of the ill person. So, so who is telling the story of the caregiver? Because there are three uh, repressions uh, hanging over the caregiver. Uh, the first repression, I mean, maybe there are more, but I can think of three now. Uh, a, a social or political one in terms of the state living on their own to the caregivers. The, the, the society uh, doesn't provide resources to the people who are supposed to be a normal citizen and at the same time taking care of someone. How do you do that without uh, help? But it's not also, a, it's not only a public or political problem, it's also a family problem.
because uh, especially if you're a woman um, you're supposed to know how to take care of your people if you're a man obviously you can learn how to take care of someone but you're not supposed to do that until life happens but if you are a woman you will be uh, very likely educated just in case you have to take care of of your crowd okay so so the family seems to be expecting for you to take care of your people that nobody teaches you to do so and the third repression which is the more conflicted one and in which I was in which I was more interested was the self repression the self censorship because the caregiver doesn't usually feel the right to complain, the right to suffer, and the right to have pleasure too, because it's the other who is suffering, who is uh, having the illness. So the caregiver doesn't notice that the caregiver has a very specific form of illness too, the illness of the illness of the loved person. And that's a very specific kind of illness. Um, so so uh, caregivers don't usually talk to the others of what they're going through and these these make very makes very difficult the grief or the, you say grief the, the grief process is not only about losing a person but as well to losing the right of enjoying life when you f are finally uh, uh, theoretically free you lost your capacity of enjoying life it's like the after war survivors who feel guilty of having survived so they are oscillating you say oscillating between the joy of having survived of the and the guilt of having survived and, and these contradictions are very much uh, explored in Elena's diary who is a kind of a monster who tells everything that all caregivers have talked or felt and never told to anybody uh, including me, I I I, I took I took um, care or I, I was the care of my mother and my father, and I was very interested in this subject because first my father got ill, and my mom uh, took care of him. But uh, uh, interestingly and sadly enough, then it was it, there was a role reversion because my father saved his life he recovered and then my mom got ill and died so I saw how a caregiver can be the ill one shortly after mm -hmm. so I thought I, I started to think about the weaknesses or of the character who is supposed to be the strong one so so those are the two plots you know the road trip and the caregiver novel so the story in some way is autobiographical Everything is in some way autobiographical, and everything is not. Um, I mean, any imaginary st story will eventually end up being a mirror, and any very intimate uh, story will end up being something else. Uh, there's no way you can escape that uh, mixed uh, process. That can be more obvious or less obvious, but um, for example, um, I do believe in autobiographical literature, but I don't believe in the I. I don't believe in the I. I think that's a, a kind of philosophical construction. I mean, it's just a, the I is just an hypothesis, a social hypothesis, just mm -hmm. so that we can work as citizens, but the I doesn't exist. Um, uh, um, and in the writing, you can feel that very profoundly because if I had written my experiences as a caregiver in first person, I would have not dared to say certain things because self-censorship and self-repression would have been working. So it was much more sincere for me to become someone else, to become a woman called Elena with a few years more than me and with a little child, I mean, that, that wasn't clearly me, my I, but she made me say some things that I would have never dared to say in my own behalf. That's why I don't believe in the I, but I do believe I in the truth of literature, but not through the direct uh, sincerity. It's a complex 
sincerity through fiction. Right. So fiction to me is the best way to approach a certain very painful or difficult or conflictive uh, subject. And, and I'm very offended when someone suggests that certain very uh, delicate or, or urgent, urgent subjects shouldn't be addressed from fiction because they are so, you know, politics or whatever. This, some people think, would deserve, you know, a non-fiction approach, a more real approach. What's real? Uh, but when you do this real approach, then you start to think about yourself, your crowd, your family, your colleagues, because it's you, your I, your social I. But if you go through fiction, this displacement will provide you more freedom to right. explore what you actually think and feel. Well, we all know that reading is a very subject subjective experience. Um, personally, uh, to me, your book reminded me a little bit of uh, Virginia Woolf's To the Lighthouse, in the sense that the narrative style is all through the minds of these yeah. characters. Um, I'm curious to know if she has been an influence in your work or not. Well, I worship her. <laughs> uh, I am um, definitely shorter. <laughs> Than her, <laughs> all senses. Uh, yeah, to me, it's my one of my uh, idols or heroes. Um, not only in literary terms, intellectual terms as well. Uh, he's uh, her. Um, it's it's good. I say he is. I mean, I can be her, and <laughs> she can be me, but I can be her. Um, her, I mean, political approach to the gender conflicts uh, to me are a reference still nowadays I mean uh, she uh, invented a way of naming say certain conflicts for the very first time I'm not only thinking about um, a room of one's own which is obviously um, a, a founding can you say that Fun uh, foundation fo uh, founding uh, text but as well um, I'm thinking about this other little book on being ill I mean she had this gift for uh, the silence problems for the conflicted subjects and that's why maybe she ended up inventing this stream of consciousness because that's a silent way of right. saying difficult things in a loud secret voice which can be much more effective than you know a loud voice uh, sorry uh, I said loud voice no low voice much more effective than speech in loud mm -hmm. voice. Um, so the, this, yeah, this stream of consciousness uh, sums up uh, very good how she detected where the silence were, both in terms of madness or illness and in terms of gender, obviously. Mm -hmm. uh, but as well, since in Travel of the Century, the, the, the previous novel was written in a very wide third person like everything you can do with the third person I was trying to do in that book very flexible third person but there was there was no monologues there I was really looking forward to do the opposite you know um, as as uh, Stravinsky said once I need rules to be free as long as I can choose my rules but freedom is not being out of rule but choosing your rules and and I was looking forward to choose the rules of the monologue, which gives you completely different uh, possibilities and limitations too. So this book is pretty much the opposite to the travel of the century, exploring what you can do with the first person and different types of third persons. And it was very moving to me. Working with the breathing is not only about uh, a child. Uh, a woman and a, a man, but it is as well as, as how you breathe, where you stop, where wh how you choose your pauses when you're writing, talking, and thinking. So it was a kind of a so it's a simple plot, if you like, but in terms of syntax, it was very difficult right. to me because, for example, when you're writing, when I was her. I thought it would be so hard to be Elaine. I was so scared because, I mean, I am a man. I was educated like a man, which is a terrible thing. Um, so, as you many of you know, so I thought the 
how do you say, patriarchal. I cannot pronounce that word. Patri patriarchal? Exactly. Patriarchal. Yeah, so the, the patriarchal education was working on my mind, I was sure, and I was very sus suspectful, you say, I'm going to be betrayed anytime. Uh, so I, I thought it would be so difficult to be a, a woman, but through the way of talking she chooses, it was m easier than I thought because she is a kind of literary woman writing, so she could do anything with the language, so that helped a lot. But the child, I couldn't choose almost any adjective. I mean, when, when, when I crossed out an adjective, I couldn't find any other adjective because my possibilities were so narrow there and the syntax had to be so desperately uh, desperately uh, simple that I found it very hard to to find the tone the linguistical tone for the child and the father is talking as if he was out of breath all the time he's in a rush he tried to do to, to say everything in the same sentence as if he was scared of dying after a period so he avoids periods, just in case. So he's constantly trying to add something else to the, in the following phrase. So the syntax was just the opposite to, to his son. So it was interesting to, to explore those syntaxes, and that gave me many problems and many joy, much joy, literary joy. That's what I search for, problems. I, I search for problems, linguistic problems, so that they provide me lots okay. of, of joy in terms of writing. Moving on to, to Lito, I thought the voice of Lito was fantastic. <laughs> uh, and I think one of the, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think one of the things that... Um, oh I'm sure I will do a terrible thing now, but... <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you. That's good. Thank you. One of the themes that you're trying to, to deal with um, is this concept of, of hiding death to children, right? Oh, yeah. Um, he has no idea his father has this disease. He mm -hmm. thinks it's a, it's a cold or it's allergies. He knows he's ill, but no, I, he doesn't know he's so seriously ill. Right. Yeah. Um, I'm curious, do you defend or condemn <laughs> this through the novel? Because it wasn't clear to me I, if you're for this concept mm -hmm. of hiding pain and death to children or if, mm -hmm. if um, if you're for or against it. That's a very interesting and complex question because my opinion is not necessarily the opinion of the characters. So I will give you two answers, to say the least. My personal opinion is you should say the truth to children in the terms they can understand, but not, not hiding the truth, just adapting the truth mm -hmm. if you want, but not saying just the opposite. But it doesn't matter what I think, really, because they decide not to say the truth to the children. And to be honest, that's what most people do. So I was more interested, not in my opinion, right. that's not relevant. Uh, I mean, maybe relevant in a conversation between you and me, but not relevant for the book at all. So I, I didn't want to condemn nor suggest that you should say the truth or lie to the children. I just was interested in exploring the classical lies we say to the children when some conflict uh, shows or appears. So I thought it was more interesting for the parents of the book to lie to their children because then you have the conflict of having to hide something, having to pretend, and that's how human beings are. We are like that, so uh, it, it would have been disappointing to have you know, a model family saying right. to the children and being so communicative and understanding. No, no, I, I needed a real family. So real families have secrets, lies, contradictions, that's right. what uh, family is about. Uh, and I was very careful not to condemn nor su suggest I, I, I agree? did agree or disagree with this, but I was very concerned uh, rather about how her mother all the time, and, uh, and, and the father too, are very doubtful about whether they did uh, right or wrong. Right. Should be lying to a child uh, and at the same time I can't tell the truth now so yeah. we protect the others by lying them we think we protect our people lying 
this is for your own sake. I'm, I'm telling you a lie for your own sake. Mm-hmm. I think that's the first step of a novel. I'm going, I'm going to lie you for your own sake, and then you have a novel. Even I'm going, I'm going, gonna to lie myself for my own sake, and you have psychoanalysis. <laughs> so, <laughs> exactly. So uh, halfway through between psychoanalysis and novel are all the conflicts I am interested in. Yeah. Uh, so it's talking to ourselves and lying to ourselves. So yeah. every character is lying to him or herself because the child suspects something but doesn't dare to ask. Because children always know, in a way. But say, okay, if my parents are, you know, playing that anything is happening, maybe I will believe nothing yeah. serious is happening. Although I know something is happening. So he can stop playing just in case something bad happens. So he's desperately playing as a way of running away from the shadow of this doubt. So he's lying to himself. Uh, Elena is lying to herself uh, all the time, uh, saying that everything she does is for her husband and her child, but she comes to a stage in which she has to face the truth. She needs she need to do something for herself, too. So she's not only sacrificing herself. Uh, that's the problem of the caregiver. Uh, she, uh, she or he can't confess that um, sometimes you do some, th- some things for out of guilt, you know, just to not regret things after a bad thing happens. So it's not as easy as sacrifice yourself. The selfishness of the caregiver is a very important thing to keep. Yeah. to preserve your uh, your ego when you're taking care of someone but at the same time it's so difficult to accept you're doing so and and him obviously um, has decided to lie the little child and hasn't been a good father he thinks he hasn't he hasn't been a good father and he's giving himself all the time excuses about this I say I'm not gonna die thinking I was a bad father I'm gonna rewrite a bit in my memory so he's not only creating a good memory for the son, but just trying to rectify uh, uh, before it's too late. So, so they are uh, cheating and lying uh, each other out of love. Right. And, and, and that's a novel is about how love can be so twisted and yeah. difficult. I think we could talk about this novel for a whole day, <laughs> but I'm gonna move on to some other things that, that are fascinating about Andres. Um, Aside of your work um, as a novelist and as a uh, short story writer and a poet, because Andres is also a poet, wonderful poet, you're also a blogger, a uh, very active blogger. And I've um, had a chance to read your blog, and it's fascinating. And I would like to ask you, what, how is it different to write for a blog? Uh, as opposed to writing for a traditional mode of pub- publish, published work? Well, this is only my opinion. Uh, this is not a general theory. I mean, I don't know how is difference, general difference between blogging and publishing. In my, to my liking, it's just the same. In terms of the seriousness with which you approach to the writing, I mean, I, I uh, correct and revise, and I, I am as careful uh, when I'm writing my blog as I am when I'm supposed to be publishing a book or something. Um, to me, everything that the writer writes should be literature, good or bad. I mean, you do your best, but you shouldn't be saying, "Oh, this is not, you know, my literary writing." That that should be impossible for a writer. So I I try to, to write literature the best I can. Uh, regardless it's a blog or a Twitter or whatever um, adapting to the format obviously if you're you know tweeting something you're thinking in aphoristical terms uh, for, for example um, but I do have a lot of fun r- writing the blog uh, especially because uh, there are no obstacles between I mean material obstacles between your opinion and, the, and your readers you don't you don't need to think about you know the newspapers the length they need maybe they're not interested in this subject or maybe someone else has already said something about these uh, besides obviously you know the 
implicit censorship of great media. You don't need, you know, a dictator to shoot you to self-repress. Right. Because, you know, there are so subtle ways of saying, mm, maybe you shouldn't, you know, criticize this. You know what you shouldn't say when you're writing for national newspaper. Nobody accepts this, obviously, again. But everybody knows that there are certain opinions. That, and you have your audience, you say, okay, I'm, I'm writing for the New York Times, I'm writing for the Washington Post, I'm writing for the right-wing newspaper, or the left-wing newspaper. So you're too worried about uh, all kind of silly things that right. end up to be uh, the center of, of your opinion. Whereas when you're blogging, you're just thinking about your own opinion. You can be wrong or not, but there are not uh, such a strong uh, limitations. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying that we don't need a professional journalism, but in fact we do. We do, because only professional journalists can, you know, do a proper research, traveling to, s to, s to see certain things, but I think it's a good complement of the traditional journalism. And um, I decided in my blog not to put almost never uh, pictures or videos or these things uh, like kind of kind of political statement. I mean, political in terms of ideological statement, saying words are enough. Mm -hmm. I mean, we don't need anything else uh, than words in literary mm -hmm. terms. Like saying, I'm 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 gonna do a very old-fashioned blog. I love internet. I have you know many computers. I have an iPod. I had an iPad. I have a laptop. I have an iMac. I'm all the time online, so I'm I'm not at all against internet on the contrary but I do hate this misunderstanding and saying okay so maybe new literature sh should you know offer something else no it's literature <laughs> I mean it's words la a verbal language uh, isn't that enough it's more than enough so so if you're doing videos or something that can be really interesting but it's not literature it's maybe a new art we can invent a new art if you want of, uh, that could be interesting but it's like, you know, when the, when the cinema tried to be like the theater and it was so absurd until it emancipated from theater. Uh, so, so maybe there will be a eighth or nine, and ninth art involving all the <coughs> multimedia possibilities. But as for literature, in my opinion, consists uh, words. of words, and that's more than enough. But obviously, obviously those words will be changed uh, by uh, the society and, and, and I mean technology can change your rhythm but won't diminish the importance of words right. can um, you say diminish? diminish diminish I, I uh, maybe I was thinking was sorry for my mistakes with English there was a really um, touching and um, I will try to diminish them <laughs> There was a great blog post about um, your translator, Nick. Oh yes, Spitzer, that's very fun. And I wanted to t talk a little bit about the translators because yeah. they're a huge part of why we're here today. We couldn't have Andres here today if it wasn't for his work being translated to English. So uh, Nick Castor and Lorenza Garcia translated um, Talking to Ourselves. But you had a really great, great blog post about an incident with Nick Castor at, at a <coughs> dinner. Well, it wasn't Nick because it what is other of my translators. Nick and Lorenza are the translators of my oh books okay. and they are uh, British although they travel a lot to the okay. States. It was another it but was George Henson, oh, which George is Henson. A, an American translator, okay. he has translated many of my stories and poems uh, mainly for World Literature Today magazine. Okay. So he's one of my translators, but I, I, ho I hope Nick is doing well Okay, now. sorry, no, but, uh, it was but, a Nick. But George, the poor George, almost died the other day in a very funny way, which is amazing. He found it very funny. He himself tell, told a joke <laughs> after immediately after being just about to die. Because we were having dinner in a banquet. I love dark humor. I mean, to me, it's the most uh, funny thing in the world. Uh, so we were having a banquet. And um, shortly before uh, a speech I was supposed to, to deliver, and the the keynote speech, uh, no, no keynote. The keynote is like opening. 
Yeah. Yeah. So this is the closing. Okay, speech. the closing. Speech. So before the final speech, it it turned out to be that the translator suddenly started to cough, out of breath, and he stood up. You know, his eyes wide open, and say, and say, and and we thought it was a joke <laughs> in the beginning, but the poor man was really uh, unable to to we breathe, and um, he he f um, fell in on the floor, and, and we really was we were so scared then, and I was trying to help him, but I I really don't know how to do that, and I, I really regret that <coughs> and I should have you know. Uh, learn how to help the person who is uh, uh, choking. 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 Uh, so I started to cry. Uh, a doctor, please, a doctor. And I was at the same time was saying, isn't this too literary? I mean, my translator is dying before I'm doing my speech, so I will be unable to deliver a speech without my translator. Mm -hmm. Um, so he's he's speaking really, really uh, bad timing. <laughs> no, no, I was so now really being serious. I was so scared that that I that I started to cry, watching him, and I clearly saw how absurd life is. I I clearly saw this is how life works. I mean, in the worst moment, in the most absurd way, suddenly tragedy appears out of blue. And that's it. I mean, he won't die saying big words, delivering a speech, you know, writing his epitaph. No, he will die like this. And I can do nothing about it because I don't know how to help people who are choking. And and I was I was crying and shouting, a doctor, please, a doctor. And everybody was so nervous with the ties, you know. Everybody so formal, rich people, you know, waiting for their speech. And so 200 people just watching this man <laughs> die. So I think... If this wasn't tragic, it, it would be so funny because I mean it's like a Monty Python situation. And suddenly, a teacher, a professor of, of linguistics, funnily enough, a uh, very strong man because George is a let's say a rotten, we could say, uh, rotund, rotund uh, <laughs> human being. Uh, so we needed a strong man to hold him. And he started to push his chest and doing all these complicated uh, maneuvers, uh, trying for him to to to, uh, to breathe again. And they did this uh, heart massage too. And I really thought he was dying. And I said, I can't believe this is happening. And just when I was starting to cry, silently, I even took two steps far away from there saying, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm going to contemplate this tragedy, in this perfect absurd tragedy. And I was starting to cry. And then he suddenly moved his legs, stood up and said, oh, I'm afraid I was enjoying too much my dinner. <laughs> 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 and I found it so brilliant. I say, George, <laughs> you're clever even when you're dying. <laughs> Can you stop being so clever? I mean, <laughs> could you do that again, <laughs> but in a more relaxed yeah. way? Uh, so, so yeah, George is perfectly all right now. That's why I'm being uh, so sarcastical. I but will. but he did this joke. The first thing he did after resurrecting was a joke. <laughs> so he confirmed me that the black humor is the only possible humor. Yeah. <laughs> well, what was your your la moraleja? What was the the? Because at the end of the blog post, you say this this taught me something oh yeah because then I had to deliver my speech but I was uh, almost unable because I mean I was in a shock so I tried to relax I had you know one or two whiskeys <laughs> I tried to calm down and I said George thank you so much for your performance because you remind us in a very effective way that we should pay more attention to the translators that <laughs> translators do really command the reader's breath, breath. <laughs> and without the translators, we all would be speechless. <laughs> <laughs> that's what I said. Uh, that's the end of the post. So, so it, it, it was like, you know, like a 
protest he did, saying, okay, if you're not paying attention to the translation, you know what I'm doing now? <laughs> I'm dying in front of you <laughs> so that you understand that you need me, so pay me better. <laughs> and he was right. Well, we're going to open up for questions, but before I open up for questions from the audience, I would just one last question that I'd love to ask, that we'd love to ask to our authors, is who have been the writers that have influenced you the most? Hmm. Writers or artists, or does it have to be writers? Really? Well, that I think that has much more to do with your wishes than wi with your uh, actual influences, because y you can say, well, I was influenced by Rilke, but then you didn't go farther than Benedetti. So, so it's not that clear that you are influenced by the artists you admire the most. Right. So as an audience, as a reader, as a public, not as a uh, writer myself, I think I know w which artists I love the most, but I wish they influenced me in some way, but I doubt it. <laughs> I doubt it. I don't think it's so easy as, you know, doing a list of your favorites and then you inherit it. <laughs> those gifts. I wish it worked like that, but unfortunately it doesn't. Otherwise, we all would be genius, you know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, That's true. Unfortunately. Uh, but um, it's good you mentioned artists and not only writers. Because, no, no, I, I like that because uh, let's start with that. I love very much uh, diaries and letters and essays from painters. But I read them poetically. Mm -hmm. I think they are talking about the same problems as poets. The, the tools are different, are different, sorry, but the conflicts uh, 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 related uh, to the form, structure, the creative process is, is very much alike, mm -hmm. I think. And I love the, the aphorisms by Jacques Braque, the, the painter, uh, the Cubist and surrealistic painter who was an amazing, amazing aphorist. I, I didn't know that until I, I found this book, which is called, uh, well, in English I suppose it's The Day and the Night, El Día y la Noche. Mm -hmm. uh, and I suppose in French the original one was uh, Le Jour et la Nuit, mm -hmm. which is, I suppose. Um, as well, uh, Paul Klee, whom everybody calls him Paul Klee, but unfortunately he wasn't American was German. Yeah. It's not his fault. So <laughs> so he was Paul Klee in German. Um, he was amazingly intelligent. He played violin like my mother did, so maybe that's why I, I uh, like feel him like part of the family. And, and he was a very good writer. He didn't <laughs> publish fiction, but every single letter or article I have read from him was bright and and <coughs> meaningful, and at the same time, with a very good sense of humor. <coughs> Maybe he wasn't German. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and he was Swiss? He was Swiss. Swiss, Swiss wasn't he? Swiss German. Swiss German. There you go, that's why. <laughs> um, no, but I mean, uh, Swiss German shouldn't be amusing at all. <laughs> 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 no, but... I love him very much, and I feel deeply connected to his painting. Uh, when I was a boy, I used to like very much his series of sailors, the Simbal, Simbal el Marino. Mm -hmm. I like that very much, and I well, I did a little research about him, um, and many, many more. But I mean, I won't have a full list. Uh, and in writers, let's mention, let avoid. Let's avoid to mention you know, Borges, Cortázar, and everything, because it goes without saying. By the way, uh, we should mention, I mean, Garcia Marquez, who very sadly, but not surprisingly, died the other day after, you know, Crónica de Muerte Anunciada. So we all knew that this is going to happen, and it happened um, yesterday. Uh, but uh, in a way, he was already... He lost his memory. He, yeah, he was posthumous, a living posthumous yes. author. I mean, so so in, in a way, I did already read him as if he was dead in a good sense, as if he was a big classic. It was you could read Garcia Marquez as if he was Kafka. So you didn't, uh, nor care, but you didn't know if he was alive or not. But sadly, his family and everything well did care about him. But to me, it was like a 
uh, legend right. living or not legend um, but I will go for for the you know uh, rare names if you allow me so maybe you could hopefully find some new names um, the U Uruguayan you say how do you pronounce this strange patronymic Uruguayan Uruguay. Uru Uru I like that Uruguay Uruguay Uruguayan writer, short storyteller, um, uh, who was Feliz Berto Hernández, one of the most brilliant short, short storytellers in the Spanish language. Not very well known, although very highly respected nowadays. 20 or 30 years ago, nobody read him. Fortunately now, at least in Spanish language, I don't think he's very, very much translated. Feliz Berto Hernández. He did a completely different thing with the short story uh, as Cortázar or Borges did. It's not a classic, rounded, perfect uh, type of short story, but imper imperfect? Im imperfect? Imperfect and disturbing forms. Um, Onetti, who is a big name, but he's a bit, bit behind those other big names. I Now we're talking about the boom. Obviously, my favorite, I cannot avoid to, to mention the, my favorite, uh, favorite books. Uh, from Garcia Marquez today, maybe if he, h if he hadn't died, I wouldn't be saying this, but uh, I mean, I, I, I feel the duty of naming my favorite Garcia Marquez book uh, today. Um, El Coronel No Tiene Quien Le Escriba, to me, is the most beautiful book. Um, and I like very much his short stories. Even more than 100 Years of Solitude, mm -hmm. which, which I love. I think that book survived its own legend, which is not a uh, small task to achieve. But uh, I would say the, sh the short Garcia Marquez is the one I, I like the most. But after that, his generation had very brilliant authors a bit in the backstage, which I would like to reivindicate. Uh, for example, Juan Carlos Onetti, as I said. If you read Spanish or want to have a try, the man who chose best the adjectives in the Spanish language besides Borges, the most mis mischievous uh, author in terms of adjectives were, was Juan Carlos Onetti. You cannot put adjectives in the best way. Um, Manuel Puig, who was very related to the States and the cinema, and I was in, in, in Baltimore uh, a few days ago, and I knew a professor who was a friend of his, and I was very excited about this, and I asked him so many questions about Manuel Puig. Uh, and I would say that nobody worked the dialogues in our language better, in a novel, I mean, better than Manuel Puig. If you, if you look at the... There was a famous book, beca because they did the movie, in its English it's supposed to be The Kiss of the Spider Woman. <laughs> well, if you go to uh, El Beso de la Mujer Araña, if you go it's a movie with William Hart, I think, and Sonia Braga. But the original book, which is absolutely amazing and impossible because it's about two men stuck in a prison, in a, in a how do you say, celda? A prison cell. Cell, prison cell, just talking about movies and falling in love uh, without noticing. Uh, so it's two men just telling movies. It's an impossible thing to do with literature unless you are a Manuel Puig. Um, I love very much an Argentinian short storyteller, a woman who is Eve Huart, brilliant one. She hates Borges, which I find fun, funny, uh, because she studied philosophy. She's an Argentinian writer and she hates Borges. Mm -hmm. That's funny. Mm -hmm. And I love very much Clarice Lispector. And I can't understand why she's not mentioned when they talk about big uh, Latin American authors from Boom because she belonged to that generation and she was so brilliant and I can't understand maybe there are on gender and linguistic uh, obstacles mm. to get her the, the place she deserves uh, but I we could, we could be on and on but I will <laughs> just mention my favorite American authors uh, I do love deeply Wallace Stevens because he was an aphorist and a poet, and he did both things at the same time, many, <coughs> many times. The aphoristic uh, poet and a poetical aphorist writer. 
and I love very much Flannery O'Connor, um, and I love Carson McCullers, love Erskine Caldwell, the old Erskine Caldwell, a bit <laughs> forgotten, uh, and and I do also love uh, Williams, Carlo Williams, and Henry James because he didn't know he was British or American, and that happens to me with Spain and Latin America. Some question, maybe? Maybe, maybe just one or two, because we we really. You um, have the same book, though. I mean, people just one. Okay, just one question, yeah. sir. I have a quick, unless somebody has. Um, you, I'm glad you brought up psychology, and I wonder, and again, you know, who are your favorite authors kind of influence? Um, what undergirds or informs you in the field of psychology or even spirituality in terms of your writing? Mm -hmm. Um, you're talking about my writing, my more of a private or individual life. Well, it starts with you, and then it goes. Okay. To write. Um, I very, I'm very interested in psychoanalysis uh, as a literary, uh, as a literary speech. Not, not, not that much the clinic, because my two parents were so psychoanalysis. Uh, they had so much psycho psychoanalysis that it's like you know. I was born with that, so I even <laughs> trying to avoid that. Uh, but I think that the double meaning, which is the base of psychoanalysis, you know, the self-denial, the, the contradiction. I mean, psychoanalysis goes directly to the contradiction. You say one thing, but you meant another thing. That's what you know, art is about. So, so I'm very much interested in that. And Freud was such a good writer. I mean, to me, Freud was an excellent narrator. His characters were amazing. I don't think that they existed. So many of, of his cases, maybe they were characters, you know. And, and in terms of spirit, 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 I can't pronounce that word, which is very meaningful. I can't say it's spirit, spirituality. Uh, spiritualidad, I can say it in Spanish. Um, uh, I'm kind of um, skeptical, open to potential mysteries. I mean, I don't believe in anything, but strange things happen. <laughs> so, so I have contradictions about this, uh, and I'm I'm very interested in different uh, forms of faith because I think those are manifestations of of magical thought, which are in the base of culture and art. So, so uh, I am interested in it. Um, and I'm interested, for example, I, I think that, that um, very good literature have been, uh, has been written uh, in behalf of a faith that I don't have. For example, when I, when I listen to Bach, uh, I, I temporarily believe uh, in the <laughs> highest of gods. <laughs> well, thank you all for coming. Uh, we are selling uh, Traveler, of the, uh, Traveler of the Century and talking to ourselves outside, and Andres will very ki kindly sign your copies. Uh, again, thank you, and let's uh, give a, a warm thank to Andres This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.